So let's talk about the energy aspect for so-called homogeneous nucleation in solidification. We are dealing with the simplest type of phase transformation going from liquid, uniform structure, kind of like uh, featureless, into a crystalline solid. Okay, homogeneous. First one, let's assume it's happening randomly, but also uniformly within the liquid. Okay, what are we plotting? We are plotting G for Gibbs-free energy versus temperature. We have two lines. We have two lines. One we label as GS for the solid phase. The other one for GL for liquid phase. We have two lines. Each of these lines represent how would the free energy change as we change what? Temperature. And these two lines would uh, meet at a certain location. That location we call what? TM for melting point. Make sense? The, the solid line, the liquid line, they would cross at a certain point. That crossing point, when the solid energy equals the liquid energy, that is our so-called equilibrium melting point. Make sense? And to the right of TM, that means what? Higher than melting point or lower than melting point? Higher than melting point. Higher than melting point, which phase is more stable? Liquid or solid? Liquid, the more stable phase should have higher Gibbs-free energy or lower Gibbs-free energy? Lower, right? So to the right side, the liquid one is actually lower. To the left side, which means higher than or lower than melting point. To the left side of TM, lower than melting point. Right. When you are below the melting point, which phase would be more stable, solid or liquid? Solid. And more stable means it has lower, right? So the red dashed line represents, okay, what's the system under equilibrium the energy contour? Make sense? The lower one, which means at uh, higher than TM, above melting point, the system should remain as under equilibrium condition, liquid. Below melting point to the left, the system under equilibrium should remain as solid under what condition? Quote unquote, equilibrium condition. Make sense? Okay. And then solidification going from liquid into solid. Okay. Let's say we start from a liquid, uniform liquid droplet, a large uniform liquid droplet. Solidification. Let's say it's happening at a certain temperature below the melting point. Somehow we cool the liquid below its melting point to here, but it's not yet what? It's actually initially at the beginning it's all liquid, but then gradually from the liquid we form a small solid crystal. That solid crystal, we would call it, if it's very, very small, we would call it seed or nucleate. Make sense? Nucleate. That's the core of the seed. A little bit. Okay. Now I have a little bit of solid within this big piece of liquid. Make sense? Okay. And then let's define a few terms in order for us to understand the process. Vs for the volume of my solid nucleus. Make sense? The volume for this tiny, tiny solid nucleus. That we call it a Vs. V for volume, S for solid. Vl for the volume for what? L for liquid, but put, pay attention to what I say. Remaining liquid. So kind of like we can div divide the liquid to two parts. One part is whatever is here, the remaining liquid. Okay, make sense? And we are making a simple assumption from left, pure liquid, to right, liquid plus a little bit of solid. We make a simple assumption that's no volume change, which is not the case under general situation, but for simplicity, for simplicity we assume it. Make sense? From liquid water to solid water, the volume change. 
actually for water, the volume from liquid to solid, from liquid to solid actually expand a little bit. For most other metal, it would shrink a little bit. Okay, but for simplicity, we are assuming what? Constant, no change. Okay, and then we define GVL, L for liquid, V for so-called volume free energy, which means how much gives free energy per unit volume of which phase? Liquid phase. Similarly, we can define GVS, volume free energy for solid phase. Okay. So these are the two terms that we define, and then we can also define we are because we are creating what a nucleus, and the associated with the this nucleus between the solid and the liquid we have interface a distinct interface, and that will be solid liquid interfacial energy. Okay, we call it gamma S L S for solid, L for liquid, gamma for interfacial energy, and A S L is what interfacial area between the solid and liquid and for simplicity we consider only one nucleus make sense okay and uh, this is our what assumption we said okay the v total volume is a constant of solid plus the remaining so-called liquid Make sense? We're just assuming for simplicity this to be a constant. And then the total free energy of the liquid. Before nucleation, it's all what? Liquid. The total free, en free energy would be G1. We call it G1. It's before nucleation. It's the total volume, right? Vs plus Vl times. Okay, so this is the plot that we are looking at previously. Gibbs free energy versus temperature for liquid, for solid, they would cross at Tm for melting point. And uh, let's say we are doing solidification at a temperature delta T below the melting point. And here, this is delta Gv is what we define as the so-called volume free energy change from liquid to solid okay and from previous page we said uh, 
before nucleation, after nucleation, this free energy change, the delta G term, which is the final state minus the initial state. The final state is solid plus liquid, remaining liquid minus all liquid in the beginning is these two terms, right? The second term is our interfacial area and the associated energy contribution. The first term is the volume term for that small nuclear solid going from liquid to solid, okay? And if we said uh, define so-called the volume free energy change term in solidification, volume free energy change in solidification, if we define it as if we are below the melting point, the which one is higher, GL or GS is higher? If we are below the melting point, based on this curve, the GL would be higher, right? So if we define delta GV, the volume free energy change in solidification as GVL, the liquid term, minus the solid term. If we are dealing with solidification, we are always below the melting point. Makes sense, typically. Okay, and uh, generally, as you see, this data GV term is a positive number or a negative number? Because GL is higher, so it's a positive number, okay? That's how we define data GV, okay? And then we are going to rewrite the top equation, replacing the term within the bracket by this data GV. Make sense? From top to here, we are just replacing the term within the bracket by this delta GV term. Okay? And then, delta GV, we are going to derive in the next slide, delta GV, this so called volume free energy change is a function of temperature or under cooling. How is it? If we so called define LV as the so called latent heat, for a material. Latent heat means the amount of heat per quite often per molar per mass that is released by the liquid as it goes from liquid to the solid. That's so called the latent heat. Okay. And of course we use per unit volume here we, instead of using the molar, we are just using per unit volume. Okay. Then in the next slide, we are going to derive it, but uh, just to keep it now, the so-called data GV term. The volume free energy change from liquid to solid below the melting point is LV times data T divided by TM. What does TM mean? Melting temperature. Data T is so-called under cooling, which is how much you are below the melting temperature. Okay, so the data T and the TM, the, their unit would what? Cancel with each other, makes sense? And then the data GV term should also have the unit of LV, which is the latent heat term. And here we define latent heat per volume. Okay, so the data GV term would have the unit of joule per cubic meter, cubic centimeter, something like that. So let's say we accept this. This is our so-called uh, uh, free energy, volume free energy change for the solidification. It's a function of what? For a given system, TM would be fixed, right? For a given metal, the TM would be fixed. For a given metal, what about uh, the so-called latent heat per volume of liquid? It's also fixed, right? How much heat it can give out per unit volume is also fixed. So the data GV term, this so-called free energy volume free energy change only depends on what? Data T, so-called under cooling or super cooling. Under cooling means the temperature, how much you are under, means you are below the melting temperature. It's actually linearly dependent on the so-called under cooling. The larger the undercooling, the larger this so-called data GV term. The larger the volume free energy change term. The smaller the undercooling, the smaller the data GV term. If the undercooling is zero, which means what temperature? Melting temperature, you have zero driving force. Make sense? Okay, so let's first accept this. Then, 
if we are assuming so-called isotropic, we are making assumptions again. We are making assumptions about the geometry of the nucleus. What geometry we assume? Sphere. Very simple, right? And then also assuming, as I we mentioned, isotropic, which means the interfacial energy does not depend on the exact crystal orientation, crystal plane exposed. Then, do you see that the so-called delta G, the Total free energy change from liquid to solid, okay, the final state minus initial state would be a function of R for radius, and it will be the, from here, Vs is 4 over 3 pi R to the power of 3 times delta GV, right, plus we are assuming spherical 4 pi r squared, that's the total surface area for a sphere times the interfacial energy term. Of course, don't forget the negative sign here, negative sign here. Make sense? So what does this tell us? It tells us the total free energy change from initial all uniform liquid to the final, which is liquid, majority liquid plus small size r radius solid is this much okay it has two terms one term the red one dashed red one is always what positive right that uh, the gamma term is always positive the four pi r square is always positive so the red term is always positive the blue term is always negative as long as we are below the melting point because we said that a GV is always what? Going from liquid to solid, that a GV is always what? Positive or negative? Positive, right? Because we are dealing with below the melting point. That a GV is below the melting point. So liquid is higher, that a GV is liquid minus solid. So that a GV is always positive. Make sense? So, and then we have this negative sign in the front. So the blue term together is always negative. So if I'm going to plot this, the red term would be a function of r to the power of what? The red term together is a function of r radius to the power of 2. Well, the blue terms uh, is a function of r radius to the power of 3, but it, don't forget the blue term is always negative. So if we're going to plot the so-called delta g versus r for radius, we're going to have the red term, which is the interfacial energy term. It is the interfacial energy times the interfacial area is always positive depends on the square term of radius well the blue term is so called from the volume portion it depends on the radius to the power of 3 okay and the total free energy would be combined. You have to add these two, the positive and negative together. And what people find is you would always have this kind of end, the net net black curve. This black curve, this black one represents the total free energy change, the delta G term, the delta G term. So initially start from zero, initially goes to positive and then reach maximum maximum and then decrease and gradually become more negative okay this is just the, when you add the blue and the red together they are going to have a always have a positive number somewhere depending on the parameters before okay so this is what we have